Thanks, Dylan. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining this next installment in our quarterly webinar series on the pre development program. Um, next slide, Dylan. You know, we're going to kick things off with an overview of the pre development program. For those who are familiar with it, this will be a bit of a refresher for those who are new to the program. Yeah, I would I would encourage you, as Dylan mentioned, to submit any questions in using the chat feature in WebEx. There will be a section at the end to ask any questions about that. Um, next slide. So for those who aren't aware of or unfamiliar with NYSERDA and New York Sun, New York Sun is the solar program at NYSERDA. It's an initiative that that administers, administers a wide variety of programs incentives to develop new grid connected solar projects. Um, the perhaps the most relevant component of the New York Sun program in here um, in May of 2020, the overall goal of, of installing six gigawatts of solar statewide by 2025 is a new mandate that the solar program is operating under. Um, and in addition, there is $200 million in additional funding that is intended to benefit low to moderate income households, uh, affordable housing, environmental justice communities, and just disadvantaged communities. And that includes the pre-development program that, that's, a, that's a key component of advancing projects that will benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, next slide. So the, the uh, the official name is it's PON or Program Opportunity Notice 3414 Affordable Solar and Storage Pre-Development and Technical Assistance Program, but it's commonly referred to either as PON 3414 or the Pre-Development Program. Um, applications for this program uh, began uh, last last summer, or it was initially open for a couple of years from 20, uh, the end of 2015 through 2018 and is now will be open from you know, starting last summer through the end of 2024. This program provides grants of up to $200,000 that are supposed to focus on the early stage development of projects that will, will benefit regulated affordable housing and, and, or, and or community led solar installations that will benefit low to moderate income household disadvantaged communities, environmental justice communities as well. You know, the uh, eligible grant applicants this grant program is really focusing on affordable housing providers, community based organizations and agencies, um, or they can also be technical service providers that are working in close partnership with these sort of community based organizations. Uh, the eligible projects can be located anywhere in New York, including uh, Long Island service territory, which makes this grant program somewhat unique. Often nice sort of program is, is restricted to the service areas outside of, of both municipalities and Long Island, but this program applies statewide. Next slide. Uh, I guess the a, a key, uh, another key bit of information is there's a, a quarterly submission deadline, calendar quarterly, so, so March, June, September, uh, December. The next deadline that is coming up is March 31st. If you miss that deadline, there will be a, another quarterly deadline at the end of June. So if you're just learning about this program now, don't worry. This program will still be open. There still will be funding available. Um, uh, additionally, while applications will be reviewed on the calendar quarterly uh, basis, you know, there, there is some flexibility for, for reviewing outside of that. It, it, it's primarily set up as, as calendar quarterly, but you know, if there if there is need, you know, we can there's flexibility to move outside of that. Um, typically, notices for awards, you know, the target is to let applic applicants know if they have if their application has been received or or approved or rejected in four to six weeks after each each deadline. Um, and after that point, that begins a contracting phase, and then the projects will commence after that. Um, next slide. Th this next slide is just showing you what the what the, the the submission deadline is. Additionally, we initiated this quarterly webinar series to coincide with the the application deadline. The idea that there would be an update webinar before the application, if there's new information to share about how program rules will be applied and and so forth. Um, next slide. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll pause one second because I'm going through this overview relatively quickly, but it, just as a quick reminder, both a recording of this webinar and these slides will be made available afterwards. And, and so if you if you want to look at, you want to print out a picture of the submission deadline, you'll, you'll be able to do so. And you'll be able to get the slides. Um, here are just some, some key terms here. Um, one, regulated affordable housing that you know within the context of this program that typically refers to to uh, multifamily affordable uh, multi or typically affordable housing properties that are under some sort of a regulatory agreement with an oversight authority you know, the most common ones are in, within new york city housing and preservation development but also new york state homes and community renewal the federal level uh, housing and urban development the hud um, there are also you know low income housing tax credits in, in the upstate region this program is open to, to you know, different structures that are, are more common of, you know, a, a conglomeration of single family residential housings that are basically the, the single family analog that you just see in, in less dense urban areas. And lastly, um, next slide, uh, just a, a few other key terms, a uh, technical service provider. What is, what does that mean, you know, for those who are operating in, in partnership, you know, that, that can be legal firms, they can be financial firms, they can be green energy education organizations, but the in partnership with, it refers to the level of collaboration with who are, are really the, the intended recipients of these grants, which are the affordable housing uh, providers, those who are, who are managing and operating those, those, uh, those uh, I guess those, those properties, those regulated affordable housing institutions, um, and you know that can be documented through a you know teaming agreement or subcontracts that you have in, in, in place. And then the last thing I just want to highlight are, are community-led projects, which is something that that we want to focus on under this program and support are projects that are using cooperative ownership models or community. They're they're led by community-based organizations, and these are another key point of, of projects that that we're hoping to support under under this program. And so with that brief overview out of the way, you know, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to, to our, I guess, our star guest presenters of, of David and um, Jose from, from the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board and Solar One. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so I could go ahead and start us off. Um, you go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, Co-ops Go Solar is, is our campaign. It's a partnership. Uh, between UHEB and uh, Solar One's Here Comes Solar uh, team. Uh, we, UHEB has the community that we work with uh, for a very long time, and Solar One and Here Comes Solar has that technical expertise, right? Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, UHEB, our mission statement really is uh, we empower lower, uh, low to moderate income residents to take control of their housing and enhance communities by creating strong tenant associations and affordable co-ops. Uh, so our work really is uh, since uh, 1973 to help build and main, uh, maintain resilient communities uh, by empowering the residents to take control of their own housing solutions. Um, we primarily work with uh, HDFC co-ops, although we do work with, the, um, like it says here, tenant associations, Mitch Lama co-ops, and we've also done work in uh, different housing co-ops across the country. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I give them a little more detail about the actual community, the specific community that we work with, and what the Co-ops Go Solar campaign is um, kind of helping out. Uh, you have works with co-ops that are incorporated as those housing development fund corporations. We use shorthand HDFC. Uh, this HDFCs are a statewide designation, although the Co-ops Go Solar program only works in the five boroughs, primarily in uh, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. Um, Staten Island and Queens don't have a uh, many HDFCs. Um, these pro uh, a lot of these co-ops also are located in historically redlined neighborhoods. Uh, so um, since the 1930s, you know these neighborhoods and these buildings haven't been lent um, a lot of money to restore and maintain their buildings, and so they have a lot of deferred maintenance. Um, and given that, they have a lot of energy burden as well. And so uh, you know we try to look for a solution. Um, and try to push forward uh, a bunch of different initiatives for these buildings. And um, solar is definitely one of those things that can, can push these buildings into the next generation. 
Um, these neighborhoods where the HDFCs are located are also neighborhoods that have a high level of particulate matter, so air pollution, right? So there's a combination between uh, the economics of um, the historical economics of these buildings, um, but also the real world um, health and safety aspects of climate change and um, environmental justice, right? Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, these specific HDFCs are organized in what's called a limited equity housing co-op. Um, the resale prices of these co-ops are, our shares are limited. So it's making sure that it's keeping it affordable for the next generation. Uh, in addition to keeping the purchase prices lower, the limited equity housing co-ops typically also have income guidelines. Uh, that way it's ensured it's for the appropriate population, right? Uh, so the HDFCs are designated to be permanent affordable housing, um, and they're also regulated by HPD. Um, and the biggest question that we get asked is, you know, what are the buildings? Um, how do you manage these buildings? How do you work with these buildings? We don't manage them, uh, nor do we own them. The building residents themselves own and make the decisions for their building, right? So um, the residents themselves have a board and their board uh, make the decision to commit to go solar, to commit to um, you know, any project or, or update that they wanna to do to the building. So uh, Jose and I and the rest of our team really work closely with these boards and you know, everyday people that aren't building professionals to try to get them access to solar. Uh, next slide. And you know, solar and innovation, renewable energy, it's nothing new to the HDFC community. Uh, this is a picture of 519 East 11, Hearthstone HDFC. It's in the Lower East Side. Um, they were installing windmills and um, heat, solar heating systems for their domestic hot water. And so back in the 70s again, you know. Um, and so um, with this, uh, there was a lot of controversy then uh, with the utility kind of um, about how do you allocate the credits? How do you kind of work with this um, renewable generation, on-site generation when you have the grid? and um, a lot of this kind of, I guess, controversy and complicated um, uh, history turned into uh, what's now, I guess, known as uh, net metering in the city. And it's really, um, HGFCs have kind of pushed and started uh, the movement to help uh, the rest of the city really take advantage of solar um, and be able to do it um, in a more organized and institutionalized way. Uh, next slide. And you know, all that uh, is to say is why we started Co-ops Go Solar. Uh, this is the first campaign that uh, focuses exclusively on HDFCs. Um, our goals are to heighten the awareness of renewable energy in the community and also make it accessible, which is very key. Uh, there's a lot of educational workshops or, or organizations and campaigns out there, um, but we really work to work with uh, the buildings and work to make sure that these um, solar panels and solar energy, renewable energy is all accessible to those that really have been locked out of the industry for a very long time. Um, our goal is also to increase just general energy efficiency in the building, especially now that we're seeing that uh, cross pollination between heat pumps, electrification and renewable energy. We wanna make sure that the base electrical load of the building is as low as possible. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, the building systems themselves are working as efficiently as possible in order to get the most out of solar panels. Um, that way you don't have to oversize the panels to make up for inefficient systems, right? Uh, and of course, uh, as part of our mission statement, but also our goal as co Go Solar is really to sustain the affordable HDFCs into the future. Um, we wanna make sure that these uh, HDFCs are um, being able to be a uh, permanently affordable. Um, and we believe that solar energy, renewable energy is a good way um, to make sure that they are um, meeting the affordability guidelines, income guidelines, um, and increasing the standard of living of um, all the families that live in the HDFCs. Uh, next slide. Uh, so with all, all that being said, um, you know, here's the numbers that we actually have, that all the impact that we've had so far. Um, these are the numbers for uh, the end of 2019 is when our first uh, year of Costco Solar ended. Uh, so, in the summer of 2019, we've had uh, 23 affordable co-ops sign up for solar. So they are committed uh, to install solar panels on their buildings, uh, which translates to about uh, almost 10,000 tons of CO2 that's going to be avoided 
um, in our atmosphere over the panel's lifetime. That also translates to 500 kilowatt DC produced over the panel's lifetime. We also were um, uh, critical for the first Bronx co-ops to uh, implement solar in their buildings, right? So we're, we're getting, uh, I guess we're, we're bypassing the market saturation and we're making sure that the uh, most disadvantaged communities are accessing um, a not luxury good, a very essential um, technology for the for the rest of the country. Um, all this, all the uh, buildings also cumulatively are going to be able to save about five million dollars over the panel's lifetime, and that five million dollars is distributed across um, six hundred and forty three households. Um, uh, households meaning families, so families are able to uh, increase their financial stability. They're able to be more resilient. Um, and they're able to keep up with uh, inflation and stay affordable um, in perpetuity, which is the goal of the HDFCs, right? Um, and none of this really would be possible without our partners, Solar One. Uh, so with that, I could pass it over to Jose. You go to the next slide, uh, and he could take him from here. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, David and Chris and Dylan, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, for us, uh, Solar One, to be here today uh, in partnership with UHEP presenting about our work uh, through Co-ops Go Solar. And personally, uh, I just want to introduce myself to all the audience. I am Jose Galvez Contreras, and I'm a project manager at Solar One. And to give you a little bit of background of our organization, Solar One is an organization with mission to design and deliver innovative education, training, and technical assistance to foster sustainability and resiliency in diverse urban environments. We sincerely are committed to making our city a more inclusive and, and a sustainable place where to live. We accomplished this through four different, uh, different programs that we have around the city. And these ones include the Green Lab Design, uh, which is a K through 12 educational and professional development program. In the city, we work with public schools and private schools, making sure that we're bringing our curriculum in environmental uh, design and innovation to different kids and youth in the city. We also have the Green Workforce uh, Program, and this one is a hands-on job training and certification program, which we work with uh, formerly incarcerated uh, folks, giving them the access to uh, skills uh, so they can reinsert their, themselves in society and be able to uh, get their, a good foot, uh, uh, their feet on the ground uh, and being able to have uh, better jobs and decent wages. We also uh, manage a park which is the Stuyvesant Cove Park, and it's mainly a native species park, uh, plant species park uh, in the East River area. And this one, it serves as a classroom for both of the other programs that I just mentioned. And then the fourth program, which is the program that I work uh, and I'm a part of, is the Here Come Solar program. And we make solar accessible uh, and, uh, to, more, to more people in New York City, particularly affordable housing. So that's how we came up uh, with you having this great partnership. And thanks to uh, the Pond Grant, we have been able to have a huge impact across the city by bringing solar energy, particularly to HDFCs. Next slide. Okay. Awesome. So uh, why do we do this work? So we have found out that the status of solar in New York City, um, there are still some barriers, despite the fact that cost of solar have uh, dramatically declined in recent decades. So we have found that this happens due to construction red tape. Uh, there is also a system complexity for multifamily buildings uh, in where we all have to share uh, a roof space uh, and it's a dense urban environment. So it's very hard for individual families to come up with an idea of how to install solar in the city. But if we, uh, if through our program, we are able to you know, navigate those uh, scenarios. And also there is an additional complexity for affordable housing sometimes uh, the information is not, not is not out there, so that's why we exist. Next slide. And we also found that there is a lot of value in solar energy technology, given that we all, uh, as a community and as a city and as a globe, we share a common problem, uh, as we know, as climate change. Particularly in the city, we have found out that 70% of the carbon emissions come out of buildings. So if we install solar, we are helping reduce these carbon emissions uh, by a, a significant percentage and also address the shared problem, which is called climate change. Additionally, the city has come up with an aggressive policy of the of five different policies through the Climate Mobilization Act, which is putting a price on carbon and it's requiring solar in new constructions in the city, as well as when there is major renovations on roofs across the city. And we also believe that New York City uh, can benefit from the uh, from 
from solar energy because we have a, a re, an old constrained grid that uh, needs the reduction from the dirty peaker plants, uh, in particularly located in low income communities. These peaker plants are, are burning oil at a constant rate and they are polluting the air of many of these communities. So with solar energy, we are addressing that issue uh, right up front because we are making it possible for buildings to electrify themselves. Additionally, uh, we believe that solar energy will reduce the energy burden, particularly for low income communities, because energy is now accessible to them and they are owning is like basically they are owning the type of the electricity that is being produced right at home. And when we have more solar and more energy initiatives, like the ones that we are promoting, we are also advancing what we call the green jobs economy. And with the hopes that these folks who are living in those HDFCs getting solar on their roof are also being inspired to find an opportunity for themselves in that setting. Next slide. So Here Comes Solar is the program of Solar One where I worked at. at and this is an initiative of nonprofit Solar One, as I said, and we, our mission is truly to make solar more effect, uh, accessible to historically high barrier sectors, particularly affordable housing. So we offer our assistance at every step of the way to make solar really affordable for people. And this is why Co-ops Go Solar is such a great campaign because you have has that footing at the grassroots level, working directly with the board members at the HDFCs. And we have the technical assistance expertise that we can provide to these communities. So how do we do this? We provide a free site assessment which means that we look at the, at the building's roofs and see how much solar could go on top of those roofs. And we also look at their Con Edison bill, how much electricity they use over a year, a year worth period. And then we come up with a savings estimate, which gives them an idea of what it would look like for them to go solar. The cost, the savings, and how much it will take for the panels to pay off for themselves, given the electricity that they are producing. So we do knowledge building too. We meet with boards and we do educational workshops like this one and others that we provide through our Co-ops Go Solar campaign for people to become more informed about what solar technology looks like in the city, particularly in urban spaces, which could be a little complex. We also provide financing and incentive consultations. Co-ops Go Solar is a campaign that it's really thrives for its partnerships. So we have many partners that help us uh, commit and help uh, and help assist in getting folks to go solar. And so we provide uh, these buildings with all the information they need to know in terms of federal and, and state incentives that come up that are associated to solar as well as city property tax abatement. And we have partnerships with other groups that do provide loan loans at minimum cost. And we do uh, what we consider the, the solar installer selection process which means that if a, is a, if a building, an HDFC decides to go solar in this instance, we would do a request for proposal on their behalf and have their qualified installers to bid on our projects. And then from that space, we would then help them select the installer that they, choose, that they uh, find out it's gonna be the best for their building. And we do consumer advocacy all the way uh, until the installation is completed because we wanna make sure that buildings are satisfied with the decision they made of having gone solar. The beautiful part of the, the Co-ops Go Solar campaign and the, and the reason why funding from the Pond Grant and uh, other uh, institutions is so valuable is because we do these services completely for free. Our technical assistance to affordable housing is at zero cost and we just really are committed to help buildings go solar across the city. Next slide. So I just want to give you a little bit of a background of uh, solar energy technology uh, for many of you may know, but others, you know, may be interested in learning about what does this look like. And, you know, in just in a general, uh, in a general form of speaking, you know, solar energy, you know, uh, at least depends on two main components, the solar panels and the inverters. So the solar panels is what basically is uh, absorbing electricity from the sun and converting this electricity and turning this electric uh, and turning this energy into electricity. That electricity will go through the inverter, which is next to the uh, wall of this uh, photo here or this diagram, and that and the inverter is converting the electricity from direct current to alternative current. In the city, uh, how it works best is through net metering. So what happens is that the electricity is being sent back to the grid, and then that electricity is credited to the individual uh, building's uh, Con Edison bill or account. And that's how you make the most out of solar energy in the city. So in the summer, when the panels are producing much more electricity, given that there is more, uh, longer days, 
then during the winter time you had you would have had reserves a bank of electricity for the days that are shorter and producing less electricity and similar it happens during the daytime you're building up those credits and then at night you will still be getting some credits from that so it's a is a is it translates to one to one summer and winter and day and night next and in the city, uh, you know, solar panels can be placed in positions where there is enough sun, you know, as long as there is no shade, that's beautiful. Uh, but in the city, we have uh, a complex, uh, dense and ur urban environments with multifamily buildings. So uh, where we can place solar are limited spaces. And these ones tend to be often our roofs. So uh, there are three types of installations that fit in the New York City's roofs. Uh, and this could be one is the ballasted array. And the ballasted array are low profile solar installations that require no penetrations. They're just sit, the panels are just sitting there on the, on the roof, uh, held down with uh, cinder, uh, with cin uh, cinder blocks, and that keeps them steady. Uh, these ones are really uh, good and they're cheap, they're cheaper than the other ones, but really work best for uh, very large roof spaces because you can put many of them and then that inter row spacing would, uh, is required as the panels wouldn't generate shade from one to the other. But if you have a very a mid size to a very low uh, to a small roof, then the best, uh, other, the best installations that would be fitting for your building can be considered the mechanically integrated uh, arrays or in, which can be in, divided into two. The planar array, which is a structure still a little uh, lower to the ground, but they are mounted on a structure. The panels are closer to each other, but you can maximize the electricity production as all the, you can put more panels in small roofs. Uh, this one uh, is, is also good. And then they tend to be average pricing, but they're, you know, they, as, I, as I said, they, if you wanna maximize solar, this is a good option. But if you have a large roof space, then ballast, it would be the first option to consider. And then if, in case that a building wants to make use of their whole roof space, like they wanna, you know, probably have a deck or do a combination of green roof and solar, or they just believe that they want to have the roof open for themselves. The canopy installation is the other mechanically integrated structure that works uh, well. And this one is raised nine to 10 feet above the, the, the ground of the roof. And you can, as you can see, you can have access to the roof at any time. So if you need to do any renovations or work on the roof, that space is available because the solar will be lifted off the ground. Next slide. So uh, solar energy, as I said, comes with several incentives and which is why we exist too. We wanna make sure that people have this information at their hands. And the first thing is that solar technology has a total uh, system cost, which means what the installer would usually charge uh, for installing and putting the panels on top of the roof. But the state is very committed to helping people go solar. So right off the bat, when, it, when a building chooses to go solar, there is an incentive as we know it today as the New York Sun incentives. And this would reduce 10 to 25% of the total cost of the system for buildings to only have to be uh, responsible for the upfront cost because the state is paying the installer that 10 to 25% uh, of the system's total cost so that the building itself or the in owner of, or the soon to be owner of the installation can have you know, a discounted price uh, for their decision to have gone solar. There is also uh, several uh, federal income taxes that can be, um, that are available to people who choose to go solar. We have the state tax credit, and this one is a tax credit uh, that can be passed down through the, uh, through the shareholders of a co-op or a building, and as well as the federal tax credit. The state tax credit could be claimed over a period of five years, and it's 25% it's off the upfront cost. The federal tax credit, is a tax credit that can be claimed over a period of two years. And that one uh, is 26% of the upfront cost. But however, I wanna make sure that people know that the federal tax credit is a step down tax credit. So in the future, this tax credit will be going to 22%, eventually evaporating to 10. And then hopefully because there is, the reason is because there is a lot of solar in the city, it will have gone to zero because we will have enough solar to provide electricity for all of New Yorkers. Uh, but we will see if that changes. And then there is the city property tax abatement, and this tax abatement goes directly to the building itself, to the cooperative entity. And this is, is if the entity is paying property taxes, they can claim 20% off the, 
of the upfront cost, and this one must be divided over a period of four of four years. So five years in uh, five percent in year one, five percent in year two, three and four consecutively until you have maximized the upfront cost twenty percent. And then after the fact of having received all of these incentives, solar would come down to about thirty percent of what you would have expected to pay initially with all the incentives. So solar can be really cheap. Uh, for people, if you take into account all of this, uh, all things considered from in terms of the incentives, as well as tax credits. Next slide. And just to give you a brief of what we do with the co-ops go solar campaign timeline. Uh, you know, first of all, if you really want to initiate yourself with the process, if there are HDFC uh, board members or residents here at this meeting, please do not hesitate to contact David or I. Uh, we would be more than happy to get you started with the process. It all begins by you reaching out to us and sharing with us a copy of your electric bill uh, for an estimated uh, cost and savings of, of what it would look like for you to go solar. Uh, then we usually do what we uh, know as a phone call conversation, now Zoom conversation, as we found out through this pandemic that Zoom is very valuable, a face-to-face -face interaction, uh, and we will discuss this estimate with you. And if you believe that solar is something that your board uh, or, the, or the people in your building are uh, willing to, to go forward with, then we can have a board meeting or educational workshops with them to bring in this information to all of the community itself, and we would support you throughout the process. And if the building then decides to go solar, we go with what we call the commitment to go solar. And you know, as David mentioned in 2019, with the pond grants uh, support, we were able to get 23 co-ops to go solar, but now we're expanding that. We continue to make this work more robust day, day and day. Uh, so that's what happens next. And then uh, we do, if you, if you have committed to go solar, we will guide you through the bidding process, having our selected installers bid on your projects, and then you will make the informed decision of who you would like to select to work with you directly. And then the, after that, the installer will uh, work with us in, the, in your project to make sure that permitting and installation process goes smoothly. And eventually uh, we would uh, be more than happy to see you uh, save money with having gone solar. So that's our uh, Here Comes Solar process. And I think that with the next slide, we can uh, go to Q&A. And that's our information as well. If you would like to uh, chat with us or ask any questions, Either, either about our process or just in general about our organizations, or if you would like to hear about our experience uh, working uh, with the PON grant. Thank you. Thank you, thank Jose, you. And, and thank you, David, very much for your presentations. I, I think um, for, you know, we're gonna take a moment to, to pause for, you know, before we jump into questions about the pre-development program in general for, for any questions about, you know, for, for David about, about you have, or Jose about the co-ops go solar and the, or in the here comes solar campaign and about the different work that they're doing and their, their partnership. So we're going to, we're going to take a, a few minutes to, to, to go through the, please add those questions in the chat and we'll be able to, to share those with the, the panelists. You know, I, I would say as a preliminary measure, I think that slide alone about the different uh, tax incentives or incentives that are available in terms of the, the federal, the, the state, the property tax of abatement that, that applies to, to properties, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, it becomes very clear for those who've attempted to do solar projects that are, are benefiting uh, multifamily affordable housing that you know that there's there's a lot of challenges there. You know, um, and especially when you're talking about with HDFCs, you have you know a multi-party, um, I guess, a management board, and just just going through that process, it's, it's helpful to have both the technical assistance from the Solar One side, and then it's also helpful when there's the the leadership and the technical assistance from from the side of the affordable housing manager, like David's team. You know, working with these these managing boards, um, so. With that, you know, we'll we'll pause for for a few minutes to to go through any questions before for going on with the the more the the general pre development component of the presentation. Uh, 
Uh, I could take that question uh, from Anthony. Um, is there a listing of HDFC buildings in Brooklyn? Um, I publicly, I'm not sure. I'm sure you could dive into the open data um, and look at HPD files, but um, you have been working with HDFCs ever since HDFCs has been a thing, and so we have a database of of uh, the buildings in all of all five boroughs. Um, we don't share that information, obviously, because it is private information, contact information for the buildings. Um, but if you're interested in uh, a particular building that you have been working with, um, you can let us know and, and we could start chatting about that. I had a question for, for both, you know, David, and it is maybe primarily for, for David, but I'll say, please, you know, jump in there in terms of your outreach. But you know there there are different options and models for for any property. There's a, a purchase model where you're going to fully finance it, and then there's third party ownership through a PPA or or a lease. Um, I guess how with those with the properties that were under the co-op school solar campaign, all of those were were purchase systems, I believe. And and I guess how did those you know you know knowing that there would be I guess you know potentially you know no upfront cost for a, a lease model. How did the, the those conversations with the co-op boards that are always trying to find the different funding for for capital improvement projects? How did they decide to go with a purchasing model instead of a third-party ownership? I guess how was that that decision process like gone through? And 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 I guess did you did you find that there I guess a follow-up that the the co-op boards you know once they understood it that that they realized that this was going to be the more valuable option? Yeah. Um... Absolutely. And I, I think one thing to the 1st thing I would say is that um, many of these HDFCs are uh, self managed um, and if they do have a manager, um, we also empower them to say that well, their manager is their employee and, and the boards have the final decision on things. Right? And so, uh, when we're, we're talking to these buildings, um, they're already thinking about ownership um, because they own their building. They're already thinking about um, how can we. Uh, leverage savings or how could we um, just better our standard of living and so the conversation just already starts with how do i own solar panels right um for some buildings since actually um the uh the impact so far slide that i showed you all since then uh, we do have an, a, a ppa building um on st nick's avenue um and so that's our first ppa building our first power purchase agreement uh, that's going to be moving forward soon, but the majority of them um, were able to purchase uh, either via loans, um, you know, with Hab Habitat, Com Habitat for Humanities Community Fund or um, the Green Housing Preservation uh, Program. They really just want to be able to have um, ownership of, of the system, right? And the biggest way we're able to convince them that it's also worth it for them is that a uh, free cost estimate that we do. We do that uh, for the 25 years, um, the warranty essentially for the solar panels. And so when we demonstrate to them that they have a high um, cost savings in year 25, uh, when they we demonstrate to them that there's a payback period always between you know four to eight years, depending on, you know there's some nuance or for some buildings, but it's on average between four to eight years. They, they're able to, um, I guess reconcile the fact that it's going to be expensive right now, but if you end up saving about two hundred thousand dollars at year twenty-five, it pays for itself, and you could also invest in other aspects of the building while you're saving money. And so, what we're trying to do with HGFCs now is really um, to make them think forward um, instead of think, thinking of how much it's going to cost them right now, um, and and really having. Having and living that uh, life in subsistence, um, because we want to make sure that they're affordable. Um, they're they're great buildings to live in, um, and they're they're doing the best they can for the residents. That's not the case for all the buildings, you know. Of course, um, a lot of buildings are um, not able to purchase cash outright because of that li limited equity model. They don't have those cash reserves, um, and so we don't necessarily try to sell or push solar panels onto buildings. We wanna make sure that if it's right for them, if it's right for the roof, um, and if they could move forward with it now, we'll support them 100%. But if they come back to us and say, I don't think this is a good project for us right now because of X, Y, Z reason, you know, we we, we don't um, hold them to account and, and try to push the solar onto them if it's not right for them at this moment. 
they come back, you know, we've had buildings come back a year later, two years later, after they did, you know, whatever emergency project that was a priority and they went solar. So um, it's really about the long game and patience uh, with the uh, HGFCs. Yeah, I just, uh, I want to echo what David said that on our end, there is no real pressure uh, for the buildings. We really don't want buildings to feel that they have to be pressured to go solar today. Um, what we, what we do is that they, we want them to know that we are a valued resource for them. And if they want to come back, you know, 1 year, 2 years or 3 years later down the line. We're here to support them and, you know. We make sure to keep track of their information in case we need to update it in the future, or if there is something that needs to be, you know, uh, revisited uh, from our perspective, and then share that information with them. So the idea of no pressure is like uh, what we uh, really want to make sure that buildings know. And you know, we what we do in terms of uh, getting them, you know, the good discounted price is that the RFP process is really helpful. Because the selected installers that we uh, already have vetted through our process are people that are also committed uh, to making this possible for buildings across the city. And they will make, uh, they will bet they, more often than not, they put their best foot forward in providing proposals that are, uh, that are decent and sound for the buildings to consider. So that's also another uh, valuable aspect of our process. Chris, we have a question um, asking if you could address the storage component of the pre-development program a little bit more specifically. And that that may be something uh, you get to a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll jump into that. I think just to, in the end, we we'll talk through the supported activities and I don't know if there's more specifics in there. I think um, maybe just, I don't know if there are any other questions for, for David and, and Jose. There were no other questions that came through in the chat. Well, then I would say, you know, thank you. Thank you very much to to David and Jose for for joining and for presenting. Um, what I would also say for the attendees is that, you know, we we would welcome other presenters in the future of of, of other uh, past grant recipients to talk about the projects about how they're going the the models that they have they've developed so please do reach out to us and we can continue that that conversation uh, going forward but thank you david thank you jose and i appreciate it having you yes thank you both yeah, thank you all for inviting us pleasure So, um, Dylan, if you can go next slide. So, we're going to, I'm going to start, and it'll be a, just a, a brief conversation about program updates, and then we're going to focus on supported activities. And, and that I think that would, and then that will go into a, a, a the QA portion where I can talk about the, the storage. So, starting with program updates, as you can see, so this slide, we're intending we will be updating it over the course of the, the life of the program right now. There, there have been no substantive uh, program changes. You know, there, there may be some tweaks to the, I think the, there, there might be some tweaks to the supported activities section going forward. So please keep your, your eye on that. But Dylan, if you could go forward a couple of slides into to supported activities. I think it's always helpful to refresh the type of activities that are supported under the program. I think some of the most, uh, I think, you know, one thing that I would say up front to to stress is that provided that there is an 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 app an eligible applicant and project team that is the the manager of affordable housing uh, or community based organization that a a project does not need to to focus or need to conclude with the construction of the solar or storage installation naturally since this is a, a project or a grant program that, that is focused on solar and storage it should lead up to the eventual um, the solar and storage installation but a project that is focused on it or i guess if there was a a separate pool of of of, of hdfcs that were interested in scoping out potential sites and a, a community-based organization 
was seeking the or the the best possible property to develop a community owned community solar project the 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 grant application itself does not need to conclude with the construction of that project it could focus on the the site selection and that that's I think that's inherent in the first two bullets of early stage project planning. There's a, often a lot of work that we've seen that there are gaps that community based organizations face when they're attempting to develop solar and storage projects. And this grant program is in, intended to help those type of organizations uh, work through those steps. In addition to, you know, as you saw with the different with the slide on the tax incentives of finding what the best business model is, you know, if you're an organization if they are an affordable housing organization, a common issue that that they're faced, or, or in terms of you know, I guess getting the full value of of the incentives available for solar is if there is a lack of a tax liability, then there are some different structures that you may need to work out in order to to monetize the the federal um, income tax credits, and and I mentioned. Um, preliminary site assessments, you know, there's the outreach and enrollment. This is a huge component for community solar projects. You know, if, um, you know, if you're, you're attempting to set up a project within a disadvantaged community, but you must find those households. And in addition, you know, we're as the, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and the, 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 the Climate Group Climate Action Committee, you know, the, we're still working towards the definition of disadvantaged communities. And the intent of this grant program would be to support the communities that are identified by the Climate Action Committee. Um, next slide. And uh, I guess the you know, the other thing I would say is that there's there's a, a broad range of, of financial analysis that that often comes into play when you're developing these these solar and storage projects. If you're working on a community ownership structure for for affordable housing um, and for low to moderate income households you know the 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 grant program is it's it it does not cover all of these soft costs but is intended to cover uh, a lot of the the significant ones that have been identified you know that that's you know it unfortunately does not cover interconnection costs it does not it cover the full range of of engineering costs um, you know, it, it's not a, you know, the, the program is not a, an, an incubator program, or, you know, for, you know, for, for companies to come in and to propose, yeah, I guess, a, a full new uh, model that they might have. But, you know, what we are trying to, to support organizations as they, as they, as they explore different financial, um, I guess, uh, models for, for solar projects. Um, with, with that being said, um, you know, I just uh, briefly I wanted to talk through, I guess, how to apply to the program. Um, so the the application process itself is, you know, we try to streamline that. If there is a if you visit the the program page again, the slides will be available, and so you would be able to click through these links. Um, but the there's a, there's an online portal which will allow you to submit your application. When you click through the portal, it will link you to the documents that will be required to be submitted. Um, and when you submit those those documents, you get an automated email which will allow you to to download and and see what you've submitted. If you submit something and you realize something is wrong, there's no penalty to immediately resubmitting. You 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 could just indicate to disregard the prior application, and so. You know, you know, please check through to make sure that everything is in order when you when you submit that. The funding opportunity page, which is also linked here, has the the full link. There's a a checklist document, a a disclosure, uh, a disclosure of, of prior findings of non responsibility, and you know other technical documents. You can also see the standard, or the, the standard agreement that goes with these uh, these projects. Um, and with with that out of the way, you know, uh, next slide. I, I wanted to turn this over to the Q&A section for the project. And so I'd, I'd go back to the question about, the question was about the storage component. And um, I guess, was was there any more specifics? It was just, could you speak to the, the type of storage project? So what I would say is that um, one of the change, the key changes the program is adding storage as an, as an approved technology are that projects, it, it's similar to solar projects, if, if a, if a, a, an eligible organization 
and a, a provider, you know, a housing authority, a provider of, of, of regulated affordable housing um, or a community organization is seeking to develop a, a storage project that will benefit, you know, either a specific property, a multifamily affordable housing property or portfolios of properties. What the, the pre-development program will help you do uh, is it's similar early stage um, site assessment work that you would do in order to, to build the property. You know, you know, one important caveat I would say is that you know, for, for those applicants that are seeking to develop storage systems within the New York City region, it would be incumbent upon them to really ex explain how, I guess, the, it, it, their, their path to, to deployment of the project. There have been a lot of challenges citing storage systems within New York City, and so a, a property where that does not have, you know, maybe a space on an adjacent parking garage or in the backyard or on its roof, you know, if, if an applicant is proposing an indoor storage system, it's likely that that would be viewed within the context of, of the lack of existing systems being approved currently in the New York City region. And, and so, but the, you know, to the extent which a, an entity was seeking to develop a storage system that would be part of a community resilience uh, initiative that was going to be owned by low to moderate income households, I, I think what the, the pre-development program would be, would be interested in or would be available to do is, is to support that community organization, find out, you know, what that ownership model is of that storage system and how it, it would be used and, and deployed. Um, you know, we, we don't have a lot of examples that I can, I can refer to at this stage since, since this change is, is still fairly new and people are still exploring, you know, what, how storage systems can be used to benefit affordable housing. Uh, when it's paired with, with solar, I think it's, it's more apparent that you're really trying to improve, improve the overall um, benefits and the value of the system. I, I hope that that maybe provides some clarity as to as to, I guess, how the grant program would be used for those, those systems. But, you know, I'm just checking to see, if, you know, if there are other questions. We have a few minutes left. Dylan, I don't know if you see any questions in. Uh, there are no questions at this time. No other ones. So then I guess we'll, we'll, we'll give it another, another minute or so. I, yeah, yes, the, well, the program is, is PON 3414, yes. But we'll, we'll give it another, another minute for folks to, to add in questions here. Uh, but, you know, before folks start dropping off, I, I wanted to, to thank you all for, for joining this quarterly webinar series. Our, our next one will be um, likely in the, in the, the second, second week of, of June. I think we're targeting the, the 9th or the, or the 10th, but we'll be sure to make that, that announcement go out there. Um, so there's a question of, can this apply to, to new construction? And the the answer is is yes, although that that would necessarily change the type of application. You know, if the building itself has not been designed, you know, if there are there are, you you couldn't include activities of the installation of the solar system itself or storage system itself. You know, if that's something that's that's five years out, there's a the the timeline for the grants. They're supposed to be completed within eighteen months, and so. If there was a list of activities, again, from an eligible applicant um, for a, an intended new construction regulated multifamily affordable housing property, perhaps it was focusing on, on outreach to low to moderate income customers who would be subscribed to the, the solar project or finalizing a cooperative ownership model, then, then, then yes. But if, you know, if, if there's something that's, that's further down the line, you, you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to include that in there just because, you know, it's further out and, and the construction of the building is, um, is a restriction. But with, with that out of the way, I, I think we're, um, I, oh, I guess, um, 
uh, Dylan, Dylan is unsettling reminding me that the, the future uh, announcement of the future webinars, and in addition to, um, you know, there is a slide which you can, you can download, but I would strongly encourage everyone to, to visit, to sign up for um, updates. You know, there's the, the contact us link on the, the NYSERDA New York Sun webpage. And if you click sign up, you, what you want to do is you sign up for the affordable solar. There's a, a box that you would check there. That would make sure that you're getting the announcements of all future webinars. And I would strongly encourage you to do so. The, the slides and a recording of this webinar will appear on the program webpage. And so if you have any colleagues who missed this presentation, please look out for that in, in the coming weeks and please forward that along to them. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either uh, myself, um, Dylan, or to um, David or Jose about the, the Co-op School Solar Campaign. With that, um, thank you all for joining and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Everyone.